Good afternoon and welcome to this celebration of generosity and service to Georgetown. Today, we celebrate our colleagues, those who've given, those who will receive the university's Vicennial Medal, our alumni and friends who are to be inducted into the 1789 Society, and Professor Tom Beecham, professor in the Department of Philosophy who has been invited to deliver the annual Life of Learning Address. If you will, please remain standing for the Vene Creator Spiritus and the opening prayer given by Dr. Jean Lord, Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. Good and gracious God, we gather in gratitude and we pray for the remarkable tradition of Jesuit education, which animates our lives today as it has for more than two centuries. For our faculty, whose scholarship illuminates and imagines the mysteries of our world. For the consoling beauty of this place and for those who labor in its service. And for our Jesuit brothers, for their generosity in sharing with us the charism of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and for all of us as we pass this gift to those who follow. Touch our hearts with gratitude for the generosity of our benefactors. Inspire us, like Pope Francis, to be builders of bridges and bring us together in community on this hilltop and in our fractured world. Unite us in solidarity with our students that together we may seek Dorothy Day's revolution of the heart and a more just society for all. And remind us of the words of Archbishop Oscar Romero. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted. Somos profetas de un futuro que no es el nuestro. We are prophets of a future that is not our own. In thanksgiving and in hope, we say amen. Please be seated. Georgetown University, University annually recognizes dedication to this institution. Those faculty members and academic administrators who've served the university for 20 years are honored by the presentation of the Vicennial Medal. Today we extend a, a special welcome to this year's medal recipients, to their families and friends who've gathered in their honor, and to the department chairs 
who've joined the procession today to help us mark this achievement. We also recognize with gratitude all the holders of the Vicennial Medal, a number of whom are seated right here in the front and are distinguished by the medals around their neck. Some of our retired colleagues in a special treat have joined us for this occasion as well. Welcome back to the Hilltop. For this special occasion, we've produced a film to document the contributions of these honorees to the university. After the film, Dr. Edward Hilton, Interim Executive Vice President for Health Sciences, will present the gold medalists, and William Trainer, Executive Vice President and Dean of the Law Center, will present the silver medalist. I cannot believe that it's been 20 years. It's gone by like the wind. It seems absurd that we've been here 20 years. That is actually a pretty startling statistic. It means I'm getting old. It's easy to work for a place that you love. This is definitely home. This is a place where I can live a life of the mind, but still be deeply connected to my students. Working at Georgetown gives me as much nourishment as I feel that I give Georgetown. I've loved working with the law students who are gonna go out and do public interest work. It's really inspiring for me to see. I've been focused on this issue of peace in Columbia now for over 35 years. And what's extraordinary is they're now on the verge of negotiating peace. What I've advocated all these years, decades later, is coming to be, and that's quite satisfying. And I have the opportunity to review applications of students coming from all over the world who express a sincere interest in coming to Georgetown. You have the opportunity to really, you know, sometimes see that diamond in the rough or that person with a really interesting story who you think, wow, this is somebody who would be a wonderful Georgetown student. That's a, that's a great day. There are questions that I want to answer uh, about the world out there. When I can frame a question and when my caterpillars or my butterflies or my plants answer that question for me. And many experiments are new, so we are like a treasure hunter in the treasure pit. Georgetown provide a uh, environment that's a collegial and also warm and tolerate if you make mistakes. So these are most important environment for a scientist. Three, three, one. There's this joy of when you make a new discovery. No one else has done or seen what you have done. And then when those elements finally come together and you can see how the story has evolved, that's the most exciting, that's the most thrilling. This and carbohydrate and protein metabolism. I love so the integration you know, of teaching and research. Isn't that evolutionally quite a bad idea? A uh, sensor substitution device. Yep. You are constantly surrounded by students. And that makes a huge difference because students challenge you and they ask you questions. There are these uh, regions in the brain that... Just as a curious question, have they seen these... And you have to explain of, things guess, in like, very different terms than how you talk to your peers. So if I make a discovery, it's thanks to them as much as if they learn something, it's thanks to me. I look at the year as this proposal that I'm putting forward. And I'm going to take them on a path. And if they will go through this path with me, when they come out on the other end, they will have grown up. They will have learned how to solve problems. I feel so fortunate to have such great students at Georgetown and to be able to engage them in serious, important, intellectual, but also just conversations about life. In which a lot of Georgetown undergraduate students aren't always the happiest about having to take two philosophy courses. 
having to teach to an audience to try to you know make it clear to them what the value of your discipline is does uh yeah does does inspire one you know to put your uh, your discipline's best foot forward no pleasure is not the ultimate and there will always be a few and in the batch of evaluations that said i came in prepared to hate philosophy so and i didn't and that's a wonderful thing i want them to think about plants not just as a green backdrop to their regular lives, but as the organisms that provide all of the food and all of the oxygen on the planet. They're learning a language, but the language is almost a tool to learn everything else around them. Pas très clair, cette histoire. I try to make them understand how a sentence is built, and a sentence is like a human body. You have to have a heart, which is a verb. You need to have a brain, which is the subject dictating what the heart is going to do. When you see the students click, so when there's a, an understanding in their eyes, when they get motivated, when they're doing stuff on their own, and they're racing ahead of you. Right. And so what I want That's to do is a moment you that you can isolate. It's something that both you and the student recognize. And there's a great feeling that comes with that. Sometimes these classes become unexpectedly relevant. Terrorism versus Islam in Russian 19th century literature. I see that. My students come out of that class strengthened, kinder. When you work with a student, if it's a student that has struggled and that you've had an impact on that student and you see that student walk across commencement stage, and that is truly just a great experience. In fact, there are times at graduation where I sit there and look at them and wish that I was in line with them going out to launch my career. They really have been what has made this job for me. They, they will go out and do great stuff, and I hope to play a small part in guiding them in a particular direction that will help the world be a better place. After taking public service leave from Georgetown for three years to the work at the White House, many of my colleagues thought I would not come back. For me, it was never a choice. I always knew that Georgetown was my home. I'm going to continue to be engaged in the world, and I'm going to do as I've always done, bring that all back to Georgetown. I think that my job in undergraduate admissions is something that I could do forever. So, you know, 20 years just seems like a drop in what could be a very long career at Georgetown. I want to end my career at Georgetown. There's no question about it. I can't imagine doing anything else that would make me as fulfilled as what I've been doing for the last 20 years. When you have been at Georgetown for 20 years and participated and grown, it's very hard to see your life without Georgetown. Will the gold bicentennial medalists please rise, as you have, and come forward as your name is called. The following individuals are recipients of the gold medal for 20 years of full-time service to the university. Paul Almeida. <laughs> Carol Benedict. Victor Chaw. Mark Chernick. Thomas Chirolanzio.
Melissa Costanzi. Angel Del Dios. Margaret Dubilius. Judith Fader. Allison Games. Diana Glick. <laughs> Kenneth Homa. <laughs> Judy Johnson. Catherine Kiesling. <laughs> Greta Kendrick. <laughs> Jean Lord. Olga Mearson. Mark Murphy. Colleen Krebs Norton. Joseph Rauschecker. <laughs> Douglas Reed. <laughs> Rhonda Rolfs. Mark Schwartz. Robert Scarlatta. Stafford Smiley. Katherine Taylor. <laughs> Elisa Wabel. <laughs> Martha Weiss. And Jian Young Wu. Please join me in congratulating all of the gold medalists.
This year, we recognize several recipients of the Silver Medal for 20 years of part-time service to the university. Will the Silver Bicennial Medalist please rise and come forward as your name is called? Mary Barnett. Douglas Bregman. Jerry Gingrich. Robert Lickerman. Jeffrey Mayer. Joseph Perkowski. Uh, Lois Schiffer. David Simmons. Uh, Eric Solomon. Shelly Temchin. Uh, David Saperstein. Please join me in congratulating the silver medalists. The 1789 Society is Georgetown's most distinguished philanthropic fellowship. Today, we recognize those new members of the society who've given so generously to support our academic enterprise. In a special way, I welcome these new inductees who are here with us today. Your support allows Georgetown to attract the most talented students and scholars, as well as to grant them the resources to enact positive global change. Georgetown is deeply grateful to you and the other 1789 Society members for such remarkable generosity. Thanks to these gifts, we are able to create faculty chairs, assure financial aid to deserving students, and provide outstanding campus facilities. Your vision and leadership provide a beacon for Georgetown's advancement as one of the finest and most world-renowned institutions of higher education. So thanks to all the members of the 1789 Society and our other benefactors, Georgetown's future ability to support innovative projects for our creative faculty and our most talented students have again been assured. Today we salute and induct 10 new members into the 1789 Society, recognizing their notable and generous contributions to the excellence of Georgetown. Now that the 1789 inductees are standing, uh, let me call the names one by one, and if you could come forward. First, the American Druze Foundation. Maria Martinez de la Cruz and Alberto de la Cruz. <laughs> the 
the government of Japan. Mr. and Mrs. Lee I. Miller. Mr. and Mrs. Paul C. Shore, the fourth. Ms. Cynthia Weldon and Mr. James L. O'Hara. Please join me in congratulating the new members of the 1789 Society. I now have the honor to introduce our 48th president, John J. DeJoya, who will offer some remarks and introduce this evening's speaker. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege to be with you all today. Every spring, we gather together to pause, to reflect, to celebrate the intellectual life of our community. As we mark the passage of another year together, we take this opportunity to recognize the continuity of commitment of members of our faculty and our academic staff and those who have demonstrated an extraordinary level of generosity to our community. I'd like to offer a welcome to all of our guests here today our Bicennial Medalists, families and friends, and the newest inductees of our 1789 Society. Work in an academic community is often understood as a compilation of significant moments, breakthroughs in thinking and surprising discoveries, new academic years and commencement ceremonies, tenure appointments and retirements. In this moment, we recognize the significance of longevity, the gift of time that our faculty and academic staff give to this place, to our students, to each other, to their own scholarly endeavors. In this gathering, we recognize another kind of gift, the generosity of our most dedicated supporters who help to make possible all that we do here, now, and into the future. And we're deeply grateful to each of them. And in this act of coming together, we recognize those aspects that have come to characterize our way of life, a way of being that is shared and sustained by those that we honor today. In recent years, through a series of seminars, I've had the privilege of engaging with students the writings of John Henry Newman. To this day, more than a century and a half after writing a set of lectures delivered at the founding of what is now University College Dublin, no one has captured the essence of our mission and purpose of the power of place and people in a university setting, quite like Cardinal Newman. I believe his words have a deep res resonance for what it means for us to be together today. Newman describes the unique setting that a university provides for the study of knowledge, saying, quote, the general principles of any study you may learn from books at home, but the detail, the color, the tone, the air, the life which makes it live in us, you must catch all these from those in whom it lives already. Place brings us together, 
tradition, the detail, color, tone, air, the life which makes it live in us, provides us a shared understanding, place, community, tradition, belonging. These words have a profound importance to our lives here on this hilltop. Together they comprise what it means to be part of an academic community. These words are not nouns. They don't capture objective states. They capture the living, breathing sense of becoming that characterizes a university community. In these reflections this afternoon, I'll begin by sharing a few words about the idea of a tradition as it, as it is practiced in a university community. I'll turn then to the meaning of place and belonging. And finally, a few words of introduction of our speaker today. Our work here is always in process, always becoming. Our work requires the engagement of each of us and all of us. Work sustained by a tradition. A tradition, a culture that has emerged over the course of our centuries. In the words of Pope Francis, culture is more than what we have inherited from the past. It is also, above all, a living, dynamic, and participatory present reality. The tradition of a university community is shaped by a commitment to three elements shared by every university, to the formation of our young people, to the inquiry of our faculty, to the shared commitment we have to contributing to the common good. Yet while we share these three interlocking and mutually reinforcing elements, our university, each university, is shaped by a distinctive history. We are, we are established in a particular place at a specific moment in time with a mission that responds to our originating conditions. Within our university community, each of us are carriers of our tradition. Again, a tradition that is never fixed and never static. But our work is sustained not only by the resources of our tradition. Our work is also sustained by a place. A place that provides the context for constructing our community. A community that provides us with a gift of incalculable worth, a sense of belonging. This is where we are supposed to be. Of course, sustaining a community makes demands of us. Again, Pope Francis, yet becoming a people demands something more. It is an ongoing process in which every new generation must take part. A slow and arduous effort calling for a desire for integration and a willingness to achieve this through the growth of a peaceful and multifaceted culture of encounter. And our community has the promise of providing a place which increases our sense of belonging, of rootedness, of feeling at home within a place which includes us and brings us together. We belong here and we have the privilege of sharing this home with an extraordinary group of colleagues without, without whom this place would not be the same. And we honor them today. And as we reflect on these ideas of place, community, tradition, belonging, we take time to acknowledge those who have had a disproportionate impact on our community and on the academy. And this afternoon, we have the privilege of hearing from one of the most distinguished members of our community, a member of our faculty who has taught us the transformative possibilities that can arise from a deep commitment to the way of life that we all share. Many of you know that we are among the best places in the world to do applied ethics. Well, one reason for this is because of Tom L. Beecham's decision to have his career here a member of our faculty since 1970. Tom was the lead author of the 1978 
the Belmont Report produced by the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, a landmark document that established the first ethical guidelines for conducting research on humans. Throughout his career as one of the earliest members of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics and as a member of our Department of Philosophy, Tom has demonstrated a deep commitment to the ways that philosophy and ethics could inform how we see the world and guide our actions, how ethics can transform practice in the public sphere. In applied ethics, with the model that Tom has provided for four decades, we acknowledge something about our own ethic here at Georgetown. It is the ethos of this place that calls us all here to our individual courses of study, to realize our own and our, our community's potential, to construct and critique knowledge, to address complex moral and ethical issues, to pursue solutions to some of our world's greatest challenges. Tom has provided a framework for all of us to engage in this work. His own research has focused on the ethics of human subjects, the place of universal principles and rights, and bio, biomedical ethics research, the ethical use of animals, the ethics of journalism, business ethics, in addition to the history of modern philosophy, and especially the philosophy of David Hume. He has co-authored and co-edited several books, including A History and Theory of Informed Consent, The Oxford Handbook of Business Ethics, the 1,000-page Oxford Handbook of Ethics in Animals, and the Clarendon Hume edition, as well as more than 150 scholarly articles. His textbook, Principles of Biomedical Ethics, co-authored with James Childress at the University of Virginia, now in its seventh edition, translated into seven languages, remains the world's most widely used textbook in the field of bioethics, a foundational text for any person looking to study in the field. Tom is the recipient of several Lifetime Achievement Awards from Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research, the Hastings Center in New York, and the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. In 2003, we recognized his distinguished research with Georgetown's Career Recognition Award. We're deeply grateful to Tom for his vision, his imagination, for his mentorship of colleagues and students, for his example of service and the excellence of his scholarship Many of us here have had the opportunity to share this place with Tom now for more than four decades. One of the many gifts that come with being a member of this community for so many years is seeing, experiencing, learning from the enduring engagement and commitment of the members of our community. We have shared the privilege of having Tom as a colleague and for myself the privilege of having him as a teacher it will be difficult to imagine this place without him. As is our tradition at the spring convocation, we ask a member of our faculty to offer a life of learning lecture. And it's my distinct honor to welcome to the podium Dr. Tom L. Beecham, professor of philosophy and senior research scholar at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics to offer this year's address. Tom. Good afternoon. President DeJoya, Provost Groves, Bicennial Medalists, Deans, colleagues and friends, thank you for the opportunity to deliver this Life of Learning Address. This is my 45th year at Georgetown, but I will speak about my life of learning only through my 10th year here, 1980, which means I will say virtually nothing about the last 35 years of my career. The reason is simply that 1957 to 1980 are unmistakably the foundational years. As a youth, I was the product of a mediocre public school education in Dallas, Texas. I was, through the early high school years, 
unexceptional as a learner. I lack the curiosity essential to a quest for learning. About the time I turned 17, this mental lethargy would vanish when I read a book given to me by an assistant minister in a Methodist church. It had the most memorable effect on me of any book I have ever read. The book is Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton, a novel set in South Africa shortly before the apartheid laws were passed. In a calm but vivid style, Payton depicts the explicit as well as the semi-hidden racism that was then tearing South Africa apart. As I read the book, I made a connection, connection after connection to Dallas, which was a segregated city in its schools and universities, restaurants, city buses, residential communities, and most all religious houses of worship. This state of affairs was sustained in Dallas by an underlying and visceral racism that I had frankly never much thought about. But as Peyton described the early South African bus boycotts, I saw the indignity that, underlie, that underlay the segregation of Dallas city buses. When he discussed the Afrikaner Nationalist Party platform of the so-called separate development of the races, I thought about Texas politicians and school officials who were declaring at the time that the separate but equal doctrine would forever remain in Texas schools despite the debacle at Little Rock Central High School and despite the United States Supreme Court. Even the appalling conventions in South Africa of avoiding touching or coming close to a black person mirrored customs commonplace in Dallas at the time. When I finished Peyton's novel, I was a different person. I was angry with what surrounded me, and I judged myself harshly for culpable ignorance and a lack of discernment. I was filled with questions which I wanted answers to. Here I think my life of learning really began. The first place I went for answers to my questions was the Methodist Church in which I had been raised. I went to discuss my questions with ministers I trusted in several churches, and they helped me get in touch with several ministers in black churches in South Dallas. My primary question to each one of them was this. What conceivable justification is there for a division between the Methodist Church into black churches, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and white churches? These two Protestant denominations had once been one church, the Methodist Church, but then split in the mid-1840s, first in Philadelphia, over the indignity of having segregated galleries for black people for church services. My understanding of Christian ethics suggested that an apology, reconciliation, and reintegration should be the objective at that time. Like the doctrine of separate but equal schools, a racially segregated Methodist church made literally no sense to me. Discussion with these ministers was a potent learning experience at age 17, however disappointing. Every minister with whom I spoke agreed that yes, it made no moral sense, now or ever, to have a segregated Methodist church. However, not a single minister was prepared to go public with that view in their, even in their own congregations. Why not? Here I came to a near identical conclusion to the one Peyton advances in Cry the Beloved Country. In his words, the explanation is fear, fear, fear. These Dallas ministers, white and black, were deeply afraid of the consequences of the integration of their churches. They believed integration would tear apart their congregations with members defecting to other churches or leaving the church altogether. These pastors seem to me more the captives of their parishioners' beliefs than moral leaders, though perhaps I judge them too harshly. I had learned what I set out to learn, but it was disquieting. I would tuck it away for future reference, but issues of racial segregation and discrimination would remain important to me as a university student and as an academic. I now push on to those years. In 1958, I enrolled in Southern Methodist University. SMU. When I arrived, I was surprised to learn that the university was, by policy, segregated. 
I knew that black ministers had graduated from SMU's Perkins School of Theology. How then could a university that is integrated be segregated? I dug into the history. As it happens, the theology school was among the first schools in any university in the South to integrate. It started to enroll black students in 1951 by an act of the Board of Trustees. But the trustees explicitly stated that the theology school was the only school that would be integrated. After the first two black students matriculated at Perkins, there arose swift opposition in Dallas to even this tiny bit of integration when it was learned that the two students had been given white roommates. A related fuss over the theology school's so-called liberalism was still ongoing when I landed on the campus as a freshman. I'm not sure how well I would have adjusted to SMU, but for one piece of good luck, I quickly made friends with a small group of freshmen who were as concerned as I was that the university and the city of Dallas were citadels of segregation. They were academically serious as well as socially committed young people who gave me wonderful lessons in how important your fellow students, not just your professors, can be in your college education. What we debated and learned from one another as we planned and conducted sit-ins in various Dallas establishments, usually lunch counters, might be likened to a seminar in the justification of civil disobedience. But this was a real life seminar with real risks for all of us. We couldn't have sit-ins without someone of color, so we recruited an African-American theology student named Earl Allen. Earl was my first real African-American friend. I learned a great deal about life and about social injustice from this man, who was several years my senior. Earl would, shortly after our time together, be severely smeared by the political establishment in his hometown of Houston for starting a campaign of voter registration. After several sit-ins in Dallas that were more failures than successes, my friends and I came to see that social protest in Dallas was frustratingly ineffective. The mayor, R.L. Thornton, was too smart to become a Montgomery or a Little Rock, and he ruled with an iron hand. So we students then turned to the task of protesting the university's policy of segregation. Eventually, we obtained a meeting with the university vice president, who would hear us out. Here came another learning experience for me. This vice president acknowledged that we had noble objectives that he entirely supported. He said the president of the university and the board of trustees had already decided to integrate. And he told us, after we promised, as he required, confidentiality, exactly how integration would occur. It would happen, the vice president said, when and only when an outstanding Negro football player from Texas could be successfully recruited. This football player, he told us, would not be very black. I saw the strategy, but I didn't comprehend the moral mindset of the administration and the trustees of this Methodist school. Meanwhile, as a second semester junior at SMU, I was considering graduate school in philosophy, which I deemed the most challenging and interesting of the fields of learning to which I'd been exposed. However, I had a nagging problem with philosophy's conception of the field of ethics, which had become heavily preoccupied with issues in metaethics, such as the meaning of the word good. Metaethics engaged me theoretically, but I was more interested in the practical intersection of ethics with social problems. Among philosophers, there seemed to be virtually no interest whatsoever in serious study of practical problems. This distressed me, especially when I compared philosophy to the field of religious studies, with which I'd spent a good bit of time in, which not only exhibited considerable interest in practical ethics, but had produced immutable leaders in ethics and public policy, such as Martin Luther King Jr. and William Sloan Coffin, the chaplain at Yale. I believe then, as I still do today, that professional training and philosophy beautifully suits one for practical ethics, and that there has been something amiss in practical ethics remaining marginalized on the outermost sidelines of philosophy. Issues of racism, poverty, inequality, social justice, capital punishment, civil disobedience, abortion, research with human subjects, and just and unjust wars were subjects that seemed to me unnatural for philosophers to address. But philosophy professors seem largely 
uninterested in this idea. One philosopher told me at the time that such work is unphilosophical. This comment was a wallop to me as a young student of philosophy. I decided to forgo graduate training in philosophy. Instead, I found a program sponsored by the Yale Divinity School that seemed almost designed for me. It had a special track entitled Teaching and Research in Religion that allowed open access to courses in several disciplines, including philosophy, in the Yale Graduate School. So off I went to Yale. Yale was a treasure trove of smart people, as we all know, both faculty and students. One cherished experience stands out in my memory. In my second year, I discovered a program started by and run by a law student at the law school named Harriet Bograd. Her program placed Yale graduate students from different fields and departments in summer teaching programs in historically black universities to prepare entering students for their fall classes. I signed up and Harriet assigned me to Texas Southern University in Houston. Four of us from four different Yale departments went to Texas Southern that summer. We learned richly from this experience, including very powerfully how under-resourced, segregated high schools had failed the Texas Southern students that we were teaching. Another thing happened at Yale. Despite my earlier reservations about philosophy and despite an unruly and ill-managed department of philosophy at Yale, I learned that I had to be a philosopher. So I graduated from Yale and went to Johns Hopkins for a PhD in philosophy. Hopkins was my first choice and it was the right choice for me. I loved the small seminar environment, my fellow graduate students, and the comparatively small size of the university. Hopkins also permitted me to teach some courses at Morgan State University, which gave me a very different kind of experience with students in another historically black university. At Hopkins, I formed a close friendship with fellow student Alex Rosenberg, and we became deeply immersed together in theories of causation. Eventually, we determined to write a book with the goal of providing a new theory of in defense of Scottish philosopher David Hume's celebrated theory of causation. This book would be the most demanding and the most exhausting philosophical work that I would ever do, and certainly a great learning experience in teamwork. After 10 years of labor, it was published in 1981. Meanwhile, in 1975, I met David Norton, a Hume scholar in the philosophy department at McGill University in Montreal. We shared a deep disquiet about the dreadful editing in the standard edited works of Hume. After sober reflection on what would be an enormous commitment of time, we decided to undertake a full-fledged critical edition of Hume's entire corpus of philosophical works. We submitted a grant to the National Endowment for the Humanities for funding to support this rather expensive research for the humanities, and somehow it was funded. Today, 40 years after planning this edition, I'm still at work on the final volume of the four that I agreed to edit. As a learning experience, I've never worked on any project in which I had to both find and consume and write up so much information. In this case, about European intellectual history and the history of publishing in the 17th and 18th centuries. These two projects on Hume's philosophy were the rudimentary beginnings of what would come to be my strong commitment to collaborative and multidisciplinary work. For that story, it's time to push on to Georgetown, which was most certainly the most influential of my universities. I was hired at Georgetown in January of 1970, and during the 1970s, my future fell into place piece by piece. I'll now explain how. Once hired, I requested to teach a course titled Freedom and Dissent. This title allowed me to teach a philosophically serious course for undergraduates in practical ethics. I started with John Stuart Mills on liberty and went to specific practical and policy issues about the limits of liberty, including civil disobedience, political protests, affirmative action, paternalism, protests against the Vietnam War, as you will recall on college campuses, were then widespread. 1970 was the year of the Kent State shootings, followed 11 days later by the Jackson State College killings, which eventuated on June 13, 1970, in President Richard Nixon's appointment of a President's Commission on Campus Unrest. This commission, headed by Governor William Scranton of Pennsylvania, issued its superb report 
on the day I arrived at Georgetown in September 1970. The report found its way into my syllabus, as you can imagine. In early 1971, I took ideas from this course to the planning stages of an edited book in Practical Ethics, which I was proposing to entitle Ethics and Public Policy. The book appeared two years later, my first publishing venture in applied ethics. Around the time this book was published, I met Andre Helligers, a physician at the Georgetown Medical School, who had recently started the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. He would have a massive influence on my life of learning, literally redirecting it. Andre and I both worked in our offices on Saturdays in those days, so we took to having lunch at the Tombs, where he had a, um, a booth reserved for him um, virtually every day of the week. I soon realized that Andre was recruiting me in these lunches. In his world, I was a perfect choice for this new institute because I had graduate degrees in both theology and philosophy. Andre personally esteemed these two disciplines because they are pivotal in a Jesuit university and he wanted to build an institute on their foundations, which he did. One day he made me a formal offer of an office overlooking the Potomac River, a secretary, as we called in those days, and research assistants. No additional salary, which I naively didn't request. <laughs> I accepted the offer without hesitation. Andre was a person with presence. I learned quickly from him not only how to develop what was truly a new field of learning, that is bioethics, but also about leadership, about mentoring, and most of all, vision in a university. Andre was the right person at the right time for me. Andre would soon introduce me to a young professor in the law school named Judy Irene and he would package the three of us to speak to university audiences on the problem of abortion. This one in the immediate aftermath of the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, which Andre could see was destined for massive public discussion. Introducing me to Judy would have been gift enough, but the biggest gift was how much I learned from the two of them about the legal and the medical aspects of the abortion issue. And so it would go in my relationship with Andre until his untimely death at the young age of 52 in 1979, a huge personal and professional loss for me. Meanwhile, I was having a less than grand time in the Department of Philosophy, <laughs> which had become entangled in divisive and disruptive struggles. To heal the wounds, Henry Veach was hired away from Northwestern University in 1973 to be chair of the department. Henry and I would hit it off almost immediately. One day in May of 1974, he had been here just a year, he called me into his office. He said that some of the senior members of the department, all of whom were Henry's friends, were worried that I was not the right kind of person for the future of the department. These senior faculty members were concerned about the kind of philosophy I did. I, I was labeled an analytic philosopher, which is very bad in those days. And they were also worried about my influence on graduate students and about the kind of leadership that I might exert if I were ever tenured. Henry said to me, I don't want any piece of these intrigues and I don't want this grumbling to lie around and fester. So I want you to apply for tenure and promotion early in the fall. Well, I was fascinated by the strategy, <laughs> but, but taken aback, I told Henry that I had not yet been in the university four academic years and had never once thought about applying for tenure. He persisted and said it was best to move quickly, and thus it was, through his leadership and largely his movement, I was promoted to tenured associate professor in April of 1975, which was about as quick as one can be promoted in those days. Prior to Henry's recommendation, I had never reflected much about faculty mentoring but I learned volumes from Henry in this experience with him. However, Henry is not the only member of the philosophy faculty from whom I drew great inspiration in the 1970s. Terry Pinkard became then and remains still a close friend and model of collegiality for me. Through good and bad times, and we went through both together, and he has taught me more about philosophy than I suspect he thinks. Wayne Davis would soon arrive and emerged as the most talented faculty leader in this university 
and certainly the one from whom I have learned the most about faculty leadership. I move on now to three other pivotal experiences in the last half of my first 10 years at Georgetown, that is to say 1975 to 80, some of which Jack has already mentioned in his introduction. Namely, the writing of books and projects under three titles, The Principles of Biomedical Ethics, The Belmont Report, and A History and Theory of Informed Consent. All were multidisciplinary works, and these partnerships would change the course of my career. I'll now discuss each. First, Principles of Biomedical Ethics. In early summer 1975, the Kennedy Institute offered a one-week course for health professionals. Moral theologian James Childress and I gave three lectures each on ethical theory and bioethics. After the last lecture, we were approached by a psychiatrist, Seymour Perlin, who proposed that we expand our lectures into a book. He noted that there was nothing like what we were presenting in the medical ethics literature. He offered to connect us to the medical editor at the Oxford University Press. So we said, why not? Expecting, of course, to hear nothing back. But a few days later, the OUP editor, Jeffrey House, wrote us saying he wanted to come to DC to talk about this book. And he did. After a long discussion over dinner, he asked if we were willing to sign a contract now and start work on the book immediately. I think this is about as fast as a book contract offer can be made. Not a line of the book was written, but Jeff said he wanted the book tomorrow. So we said, OK. Of course, I had several other commitments that I didn't tell him about, but that's OK. The writing of this book and subsequent work on seven extensively revised editions of it over the course of 40 years, the last edition still ongoing, has occupied a huge part of my academic career and turned out to be a learning experience in many disciplines. I had never expect to know about primarily medicine and behavioral and biomedical research. Principles of Biomedical Ethics was published in 1979 and is the most influential book I have ever published. Now I want to say something about the Belmont Report that Jack mentioned. While I was working on the Principles book, I was hired to, as a staff philosopher for the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects at NIH, which had been created by the US Congress. The staff director asked me to draft a monograph tentatively titled The Belmont Report, which the commission was mandated by public law to produce. I'm assigning you to explain our moral principles and reasoning, he said. I immediately asked, what's the content of these principles? And he said, that's for you to find out. <laughs> As it happened, one commissioner, one of 11, there were only 11 commissioners, was my colleague and friend, Patricia King, of our law school. I called Pat and I asked, can you tell me what this Belmont thing is? Pat would, over the course of several lunches, explain this situation and bring me up to speed about the history leading up to the National Commission, as well as about the relevant law and public policy and about NIH as a federal regulatory agency. These lunches would be the first of many, many times I learned from Patricia about ethics and public policy, and I still do today. The monograph that I drafted for the National Commission, the Belmont Report, remains today the ethical core of the federal regulatory system of protections of human subjects, and the reach of its ethical principles is felt worldwide. When I drafted it, I was certain that it would remain forever unseen on some remote government library shelf, and I got a great surprise on that one. The third work central to my life of learning in the late 1970s is the most memorable because, among other things, I co-wrote it with the person who has been the greatest influence in my life, both personally and academically, my wife, Ruth Faden, right over here, of the Johns Hopkins University. Andre Helligers, who had been on the Hopkins medical faculty before coming to Georgetown, had arranged in 1977 for Ruth to have a joint appointment at the Kennedy Institute. Ruth and I discovered quickly that we shared a deep interest in issues of informed consent, and together we wrote a successful grant application to the National Library of Medicine to write a book on the topic. Little was known at the time about the history of informed consent, and there was no theory of it at all. The grant would be funded in 1979 and resulted not only in a wonderful book writing experience, but also, and more importantly, in a wonderful marriage and family built around our children, Corrine and Zach, 
from whom incidentally, I have never stopped learning. Thank you, Andre, and thank you, National Library of Medicine for these gifts. While working on this book, I learned to appreciate Ruth as the extraordinary talent she is. The work meetings in our dining room, which is where we held them, um, involved our invitations to colleagues in medicine and law to help us. They would do more than even the National Commission to embed me in attacking a problem by seamlessly integrating diverse disciplinary perspectives. One of Ruth's special talents. Our book emerged from headbutting debates about theory and history that brought medicine, public health, psychology, law, and philosophy all into play. It would be published in 1986 and remains today in print. I want to conclude now with the two key features of my life of learning that have emerged in this address, namely my commitment to practical ethics and my appreciation that, for me, the best scholarship in practical ethics comes from multidisciplinary literature and collaboration. In the 1950s and 1960s, my confrontation with racial injustice and discrimination gradually developed into an intellectual passion for practical ethics more generally. This passion became permanently fixed and has been the foundation of my attraction to bioethics and to controversial social issues on which I've long worked, such as informed consent, affirmative action, end of life issues, and the moral standing of animals. Although I was trained in a professional environment of philosophy that promotes and prioritizes individual achievement in scholarly research, I learned that even in philosophy, collaborative scholarship has its virtues. In the 1970s, Georgetown gave me my experiences that would move me further away from an individual research model of scholarship to a collaborative and multidisciplinary model. Over the years, I've worked with and been deeply influenced by colleagues trained in public health, psychology, law, medicine, religious studies, veterinary science, business, and of course, philosophy. By working with people from other disciplines, I find that one's life of learning never ceases. It's constantly refreshed. I want to thank all of you for indulging me in my ruminations about the years 1957 to 1980. I've been unable to get to my most recent 35 years, which have been made richer because of many people here in this room. Next month is my last month at Georgetown, so this occasion today is particularly meaningful to me and an opportune time to say goodbye to all of you in this wonderful university who have made my life of learning so full and rewarding now for 45 years. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Tom, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing a most fascinating intellectual journey. It was a real treat. I now invite you to stand <laughs> for the singing of the alma mater, which, you, which will be led by the concert choir. The words and the music for the newcomers are on the back of the programs to aid those who may need a reminder. Following the alma mater, please remain standing for the benediction, which will be offered by the Reverend Kevin O'Brien, Society of Jesus, Vice President for Mission and Ministry.
For decades, our students and faculty have passed through the doors of Lauinger Library. As they do, they often unknowingly pass under a Latin phrase fixed on the high wall above the entrance, a verse from John's Gospel, know the truth and the truth will set you free. As we conclude our time here honoring the relentless pursuit of truth, the reverence of beauty, and the cultivation of goodness, let us pray. O Lord, our creator, we thank you for the gifts of mind, body, and spirit, which help us to know and love you and all of creation. We celebrate today the ingenuity, the passion, the perseverance, and generosity that mark our vocations as scholars and teachers, professionals, and benefactors. We commend all of our labors here to you, dear Lord, and we ask you to inspire in us a desire to know and to love more, to pause gratefully before mystery, to listen and learn from one another. Set us free from bias that limits our vision, presuppositions that restrict our learning and our loving, and in gratitude that turns us inward. Instead, liberate us so that we may even more fully share the gifts we have received and celebrate today, offering them to a world so beautiful but also broken. Especially, we offer those gifts in service to those most on the margins. Make the words of St. Augustine our own. Augustine who said, O oh Lord, you are the light of the minds that know you, the life of the souls that love you, and the strength of the wills that serve you. Help us so to know you that we may truly love you, and to love you that we may fully serve you, whom to serve is perfect freedom. Amen. This concludes the 2016 Spring Faculty Convocation. In the name of those honored here today and the university, I want to thank you for your presence and also thank the concert choir for their gift of song today. I now invite all of you to join us in congratulating our honorees at the reception that will immediately follow this ceremony on the second floor of this building. We invite you to take a few minutes to visit the president's rooms, which are again open this evening. Coffee and dessert will be available in the philodemic room next door to the president's office. Finally, please remain standing in your places, if you will, until the procession has departed Gaston Hall I now declare the 2016 faculty convocation officially closed. <laughs>